Hello, so today's video is all about the Canon 650D. Now, normally my videos are about professional level cameras and lenses and all of that kind of stuff, but today I thought I'd do a video about a camera and a system that might be a little bit more accessible and affordable for, um, for photographers that can't quite stretch to the sort of full frame professional level cameras and lenses. Now, just to give you a bit of background, um, you know, about 10 years ago, I was um, mentoring a young photographer that's just starting out on his journey as a professional photographer, and he'd just gone out and spent a lot of money on the latest full frame gear and lenses, and he was using a Canon 550, um, which is a forerunner of this, as a backup camera. Now, he showed me a bunch of his pictures from a couple of different assignments, and I was really blown away. I think, actually think I preferred the shots from the 550D that he'd taken, and I was really blown away by the capability of the camera. That kind of stuck in my brain. So a few years later, I was left a bunch of different camera equipment from a photographer friend of mine who passed away, and one of the cameras that he left me was this 550D. Now, and a, and a couple of different lenses to go with it. Now, I took this out and shot with it a few times, and again, was blown away by the quality of the files that were coming out of it. Sadly, it died. Don't know what went wrong with it. I think it had quite a hard life, but it just died. It won't turn on. And so I was sort of looking for a replacement. And that's how the 650D came onto my radar. So I don't know if you remember, but back in the late 1980s, Canon launched their first ever EOS camera, and it was called the EOS 650, first autofocus camera that, um, in the EOS range. And I always wanted one when I was young. I was just starting out in my career as a photographer, and I really wanted one, but I could never afford it. And that 650 had sort of stuck in my brain, <laughs> like a trigger point. And so when I became aware that there was a 650D, it kind of piqued my interest, and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna have a look at that. And it turns out this thing was launched in 2012. Kind of wasn't on my radar at the time, because I was more focused on the sort of pro-level cameras that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. But it turns out this was actually quite groundbreaking. It's the first DSLR ever to have a touch screen. And, you know, it's in many ways, it's kind of the groundbreaking pioneer, the forerunner of the cameras in so many ways. A lot of technology has kind of moved forward into cameras like the Canon R5 and R6. And it also had this, this kind of hybrid uh, phase detection autofocus system, again, which has become, I think it was like the first incarnation of it, but it's sort of evolved into the later cameras. And... Uh, you know, that's why it piqued my interest. So I started looking on, on eBay and I found one in a bundle and I would get, this would be my first tip. If you're looking to buy one of these things or a camera like this, look for a bundle, which means that it comes with all of the, lots of other bits and pieces and accessories. So I found this in this lovely bag with a green interior with a couple of spare batteries and a timer and a, a few other bits and pieces with a kit lens in prime mint condition and with a 50 millimeter STM Canon lens. And I bought the whole lot for I think 240 pounds or something like that, which is a, an absolute bargain. You can, buy the, you can buy the camera separately if you want to, and they're, they're, they sort of, the camera body tends to range in price from sort of 150 pounds for a battered one upwards to, you know, I think you could probably spend a bit more for a, one that's in mint condition. So sort of between 150 to 300 quid, something like that. Most cameras changing hands for about 250, I think. Anyway, bundles are the way to go. So I'll talk about the specs of the camera, and then I'll talk about some of the good things about it, some of the bad things about it, and then I'll go on to talk about some of the lens choice. Because this is an APS-C sized sensor, it, in, it fits the EFS range of lenses for Canon, of which there are a vast collection and some absolute bargains these days out there. So you can build a system that's highly capable for not a lot of money. So specs, okay, so it's 18 megapixel, APS-C size sensor, which is fine, good for most things. The sensor's really good in this thing. Capable of high quality pictures. Shoots at five frames per second, which is fast enough for most things. The buffer gets full in raw mode after about 10 frames, which isn't the fastest thing in the world. But if you put it into JPEG high quality, it'll just go on and go on indefinitely, it seems. Only one memory card slot, which can be seen as a negative SD card. Battery life seems to be really good. And the batteries are plentiful and cheap and from either Canon or from multiple other people. Um, in video mode, you have 1080, we don't have 4K, 1080 at 25 frames per second. Um, it's pretty basic video. It does have autofocus in uh, video mode and that's okay, but not perfect. It can be a bit noisy. STM lenses help make it a bit quieter. And you've got a microphone input if you wanna put an external microphone on. It gets a bit noisy in video mode. Um, 
at high ISOs, but it's okay for ISO in stills photography mode. In fact, it goes up to 12,800, but I probably wouldn't use it beyond, let's say 6,400 maybe, um, depending on what it is that you're shooting. Um, this has a flippy screen, which is really cool. And the touch screen that it has is as good as anything pretty much that's on the market today. It works really well, just like a smartphone, you can flick through all the different settings. And to my knowledge, this was the first Canon that had the sort of Q button, which accesses all of your settings really quickly on the back of the camera. And you can use the touch screen to adjust most of the settings that you want to, adjust your AF point and so on and so forth. It's very good. And the flippy screen allows you to do vlogging or take pictures from funny angles. Okay, so the bad points of the camera, as far as I can make out, are that it has no scroll wheel on the back, which is a pain if you're used to using those things to control your aperture or exposure compensation, but you quickly become used to using one of the buttons to multitask the wheel on the top. So you can change your shutter speed with this, for example, and then if you're in manual mode and you wanna use it, to, you wanna change your aperture, you can just hold down a button and then that will do your aperture as well. So it's quite, you quite quickly get over it. And the viewfinder is quite, the optical viewfinder is quite small. But these are all things that you can get over. You know, I, I, in sort of 20 years ago, when I fought, bought my first digital DSLRs, I went around the world and shot a big international assignment with cameras that are far less capable than this. So you can learn to get around it. The controls on the back of the camera, I think are really well placed and some of the buttons are really well evolved. And I wish that actually they'd, they'd sort of continued that evolution because there's little things that work really well that are just so simple that a lot of camera manufacturers have sort of tried to get too clever with. You know, for example, on here, there's a great big switch that is off, on, stills photography mode, video mode. It's like, how hard is that? Great big lever on the side. And then a great big button at the top that does your ISO. I love stuff like that, pretty basic. Okay, so one of the big advantages of this camera is that you can access all kinds of different lenses. So for example, to give you a clue, if you've got a full frame Canon camera, to get a really good wide angle lens through to a powerful telephoto is gonna cost you thousands and thousands of pounds. You know, taking into consideration that you might want a few primes, a few fast-ish primes, and a couple of standard zooms and telephoto zooms as well, you're talking about quite a considerable amount of money. Now, I've got a couple of different lenses that go with this, that work with this, and the advantage of the APS-C size sensor is that you, because it's got the EFS lens mount, you can also use lenses that are for full-frame cameras as well, like the 50mm 1.8, for example. So to begin with the kit lens, so this, this came with the, uh, the 18 to 55 millimeter standard kit lens. Most people will buy this second hand with one of those already bolted onto the front of it, but there are three different versions of it, Mark I, the Mark II, and the STM version. The STM version is probably better because the autofocus will be a bit quieter, particularly in video mode or live view mode, but optically they're all pretty much the same. They start at around 40 quid and rise up a little bit, depending on which one you go for. And, and in many ways, it's just a no-brainer, this particular kit lens, because it's so light, so cheap, optically okay, not, 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 not gonna win any awards for lens kind of sharpness, but it's certainly capable. And, but there is another standard lens, which is the 18 to 135 STM, which it changes hands for about 150 pounds on the second hand market. And that's equivalent to 28 to 200 millimeter roughly. And that's quite a potent lens actually, if you think about it, it's quite capable. And I've shot with that lens. I don't have it now, but I've shot with it and was surprised at how sharp it was kind of you know it's very capable for the nature of the lens right it's always worth remembering what the nature of these lenses are you can never have everything there's never there's never no one lens will ever give you the answer to everything it's always a compromise so a couple of different great standard options there for you so the next thing that most people will be interested in is a wide angle lens now i do a lot of interior and landscape photography and the 28 mil end of the kit lenses is probably not wide enough so you're going to be looking for a wider angle option and luckily there are a few great options out there now the lens that i've got that covers that distance is the sigma 10 to 20 mil and i've been really blown away by this thing it's sharp 
and relatively distortion free and just kind of works and does exactly what you need it to and this kind of gives you the equivalent of a 16mm on a full frame camera and I've actually shot this alongside a 5D Mark IV with a 16mm 16-35 f4 on a recent interior job that I did and I'll show you the pictures on the screen and you know to all intents and purposes I don't think anyone would be able to detect much difference between them uh, until you kind of zoom right in on the on maybe on the detail and some of the noise and the, the you know maybe the dynamic range of the 5D Mark IV might be a bit better of course it's a bit better it's a much newer camera with a big sensor but you know this one this thing certainly gives it a run for its money that's for sure. There is also another option for the wide angle lens from Canon, which is the Canon 10 to 18 STM. Now you can get that secondhand for about 100, 130 pounds, something like that. And, but to all in, I've not shot with it, but to all intents and purposes, it is a highly capable lens. And I think if I had the option over the Sigma one, which I, I'm a big fan of this, but I think I'd look at that 10 to 18 mil STM from Canon just because of the focusing the STM element. The next lens that people are going to be looking at probably is a standard mill, is, is the Nifty 50. You know, I got the STM version with it. These change hands, if you're looking for one separately, sort of 75, 70 to 100 pounds ish. And um, the STM autofocus again is a little bit smoother, but there are other options out there. You could go for, uh, if, you know, if, if budget is, is limited, the 50 mil 1.8 Mark II is very similar optically to the STM. A little bit lighter in, in weight but might just be a little bit noisier in terms of the focusing but um, won't be a, a huge issue um, then telephoto lenses there's a there's a couple of great options for this the natural choice is the there's a there's a lens that canon do which is called the the 55 to 250 mil stm which would make a great trio of the 10 to 18 the 18 to 55 and then the 55 to 250 Good lord, you know, and that lens I think is about 200 quid, maybe a bit less. And I've not shot with that lens, so you're going to have to, to, you know, do your own research about these things. But I would certainly recommend you to have a look at it if you're considering this kind of setup, because everything that I've read and heard is that that lens is really good value for the money. Your other option, of course, for a telephoto is to go for a prime. Now, I have this 85mm 1.8 from Canon, which is a full frame lens, but it fits onto the crop sense camera. You can put any full frame lens that you like on this and it will work just with a bit of multi, just with a bit of magnification, but you can't go the other way. You can't put an EFS lens on a full frame camera um, without having a bit of problem with the, the framing um, because it's for a smaller sensor camera. But this 85mm 1.8 suddenly becomes, on this with a 1.6 magnification, suddenly becomes a 135mm 1.8 monster. These are about £200 you can pick them up for, maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more. But what a beast this would be. 135mm 1.8 for portraits. Oh my god, or for shooting in, in low light. You know, it's compact, it's lovely. I mean, people are spending a lot of money on 135mm 1.8 art lenses for full frame cameras these days. And this would give it a, give them a run for their money, I can guarantee you. It's a really sharp lens, the 85.18. The only problem with this lens is it doesn't focus that close. Um, next option for your telephoto, and this is coming to the end of the video, I guess, is to go out and buy something like this, which is a 300 millimeter f4 prime l lens which i've had for about 20 years you can get these for about 400 pounds ish maybe a bit more maybe a bit less there's an is version as well and this is super sharp super reliable powerful lens now the thing with this is <laughs> is that this becomes a 500 millimeter f4 lens when you stick it on a crop sensor body now, to get a 500mm f4 lens on a full frame camera is going to cost you many thousands of pounds. And it's going to be heavy and it's going to be difficult to use. Now, this, if you're into wildlife or you like sports or you like um, photographing surfing or anything that is a long way away, this would be a powerful beast. I can guarantee it. <laughs> Coupled with this 18 megapixel sensor. Good lord, you know. What an amazing piece of kit. And there are various other options out there, you know, in terms of 
camera in terms of lens lenses that you can buy for these um, Canon crop sensor cameras, you know, for probably a thousand pounds, you could go out and create yourself a setup that would have everything from sort of super wide angle for landscape and interior photography through to nice fast primes and then to really quite powerful telephoto. You know, just here with these lenses that we have in front of us with our 10 to 20, the camera with the, the 300 mil lens on it, I don't know, 50 mil STM, the 18 to 55 um, standard, and the and the 8518, let's say, as a sort of telephoto. We don't have the 55 to 250 to, to, to throw into the mix. But look at that, that's a small compact setup that would go into this bag. What are we, what are we talking about? Probably, we're talking about less than a thousand pounds, I would imagine, give or take, something like that. But what a setup that would be, and what, what pictures you could go out and achieve with that. And all for kind of half the price of a Canon R6, hell, <laughs> even less. Um, listen, I hope you've enjoyed this. This is just one setup, right? This is just one camera and one setup. There are multiple other options out there. I'm not saying this is the right or the best thing at all. It's just to give you an idea of what's capable these days. And you know, I was a photographer for a long time that was on a very limited budget in terms of my camera equipment. And I know what it feels like to be looking at lots of other photographers who are who have endless money to buy endless kit and it make it can make you feel a little bit inferior. What I'm trying to do with this video is to say that you can go out with without a huge without a huge budget. This is still obviously expensive, but in terms of camera equipment, it's not that expensive. You can go out with a limited budget and you can buy cameras that are capable of producing really high quality pictures and video, potentially, um, without breaking the bank. So I really hope that you've enjoyed watching this video and um, you know, please do subscribe and leave me your thoughts because I'd love to hear what other people would consider to be a great beginner setup. You know, Sony maybe, Fuji, who knows, Fuji X-T2, anyone, you know, could be good. Anyway, Sony X A6000, yeah, you know, you never know. Anyway, maybe even full frame. The trouble with full frame is the lenses are going to cost you. Anyway, thank you for watching and I'll catch up with you soon. Goodbye.